As I've previously mentioned, I'm super interested in movie mode, and the way it has the possibility to open up the game to new audiences. More than that, though, I think it could prove to be a great way to build a community around the game. But in order to do that, it might have to be tweaked slightly. Right now, we've had hints that, in addition to the three main modes, Everyone Lives, Everyone Dies, and Gorefest, which is probably just Everybody Dies, but with grosser deaths, the developers are planning on adding more preset game modes later on. This feels like a no-brainer, doing things like having sole survivor versions for each character, versions where couples survive and either get together or don't, or ones that have all the scenes necessary to follow a particular character's dramatic arc in the best way, and so forth. I'm curious to find out what preset games they decide on, but I'm more interested in what can be done with the director's chair feature. The central idea of it is great. Decide whether characters will succeed or fail when they get to QTEs and choices, then watch the game play out. But there's one problem that might come up. Are these playthroughs reproducible? If I set all the characters to smart and capable or dull and clumsy, someone else doing the same thing will likely get the exact same playthrough. But if I start setting traits to random, where the game generates a number to decide whether we succeed or fail at QTEs, and another player sets the same characters the same way, the two of us will, by virtue of randomization, most likely have different experiences playing the game. But what if they could have the same experience exactly? Down at its core, an interactive movie like The Quarry is a series of binary decisions that move you through a story. I don't know why I'm bothering to explain this, until Dawn did a great job of it with the butterfly effect tutorial. This theoretically makes save files relatively easy to deal with, since the computer just has to remember a limited set of yes or no responses, as well as what the various characters' relationships with one another are. Although, the relationship meters are based on those decisions, so the program could crunch the numbers based on the, just the readout. This means that your playthrough of the game can be expressed as a series of ones and zeros, representing the choices made, dialogue spoken, QTEs failed or succeeded, and clues found or missed. And if you can arrange it that way, you can translate those ones and zeros into a string of text, a password, probably no longer than 8 or 12 characters, assuming that you use the whole upper and lowercase alphabet and 10 digits. Yes, a password system is an incredibly retro thing to suggest, a holdover from the days of NES, when games came on cartridges and it cost a lot of money to put in a battery-powered chip to manage saved games. This is now relegated to the world of roguelikes, where some games will let you record the seed text describing the dungeon so you can replay it if you want to. In the quarry, however, passwords could be a great community-building tool. Imagine if, at the end of the game, you were given a password that represented your whole playthrough. Every decision you made, how you performed on each QT, every clue you found, and then, if you gave that password to someone else, they could load up movie mode, enter the password, and watch your exact playthrough, other than the specific walking around you did. People could post playthroughs they found the most interesting, streamers could show off the password of their trip through the game, letting people load it up on their own copy and watch it all play out. Instead of trying to remember what set of decisions you'd made to get your exact path and ending, the game would record it all for you. Could all of this really be easily rolled into a password? Almost certainly. Now, we don't know how many decisions there are in the game, but if you look at Until Dawn as a guide, that game has around 40 decisions to make between dialogues and paths, and then probably 30 QTEs and 50 clues to pick up. Although all of those options will never appear in a single game, because some decisions preclude others, Mike can get Jessica killed early in the game, and that closes off a bunch of choices later on, for example. I mean, it's like three choices, but still, that's something. It's a lot of decisions to write out as code, to be sure, and maybe the code would have to be like 24 characters instead of 8 or 12, but it would be a delightful bonus feature for people to play around with. You know, laying all of this out, it's obvious that there's no way they could put something like this into the game this late in the process. But hey, maybe something to keep in mind for Quarry 2 Supermassive Games? I've been the Hidden Object Guru. Thanks for watching. If you haven't already, please like and subscribe. If you'd like to hear more from me, please drop by the streams. We go every night at 9 p.m. Eastern and weekends at noon Eastern. Special thanks go out to my patrons, Marissa, Desire, Eduardo, Brian, and Dylan. See you back here for more Supermassive Games content, but until then, au revoir.